Hello and welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. What is it like to live out loud, live and in public, five days a week? Our guest did just that for 25 years as the host of a talk radio show, four hours every morning on a program creatively called Gormley because his name is John Gormley. John, great to see you. Senator, great to be here, and thanks so much for the invitation. <laughs> so John is a lawyer and an author, and he was actually a member of Parliament right right across the, the road here uh, for a term, then went back to Saskatchewan and became the host of, uh, of Morning Talk. So I wanted to start with this, John, because I did Canada AM for a very long time, got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it took me literally the better part of a decade so that when I woke up in the morning and looked at the clock and it said seven, I didn't go into a full panic thinking that I'd missed the show, <laughs> was about to be fired, and life as I knew it was over. <laughs> How's it going on the sleep front? It's going very well. <laughs> unlike unlike you, it took me one day. Now, I admit, <laughs> I stayed up I stayed up very late the night before. I actually watched a movie, which I've never done on, on a school night. On a school uh, night, gosh, right? Yeah, in, in my natural ebb and flow, I would be a seven-ish waker. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I have been waking up every morning at seven on the button. So I'm cured, I think, because I hate it between 4.30 and 5 a.m. Yeah. Again, but yeah. it's, it's what you do for the gig. So you never talk about it. You just do it. But I've loved the show, but didn't like the uh, early rising. So what was the moment, and I remember talking to you because you came on the podcast several years ago. I think we might have been in the middle of COVID and we were sitting at far ends of a table in, in Saskatoon. Uh, and you were saying, oh, no, I'm not ready yet. Then I spoke to you on the day of your 25th anniversary. I basically called into the show as a fan to say thank you. And even then, I thought when we got to 25 years, eh. so what was the trigger? You know, it had been under construction for a while, uh, Pam. It had been, uh, we, I wanted to get to 25 because uh, yeah. you know, that is some significance in a broadcasting milestone. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's like a lot of things in life. You know, I love doing the show so much, I could do it for the rest of my life. Yeah. But then yeah. that's the rest of my life. So, yeah. you know, I've got the kids and grandkids. I've got some legal projects I want to work on, a few other things I want to do. And I thought the best time to to pass the torch is when the talk franchise was going very well. And it's uh, uh, the whole news talk format has been just so strong in Saskatchewan. So I thought that was the time to go. Because there's so much going on in that world, as you know. I mean, we've been dealing with uh, Bill C-11 and Bill C-18, and and the landscape has changed totally. It's like newspapers and television didn't understand what the internet was uh, and that it was going to change their life. But it isn't affecting radio in the same way. Radio has been really fortunate. And, of course, our death has been many times uh, predicted. Uh, gosh, you know, radio, radio will always work when you communicate on a one-to-one -one basis. I mean, yeah. radio well done is you sitting in your car driving, you know, past Wadena, uh, yeah. and you know, someone is talking only to you. And, uh, as long as that works, and that's why podcasts have done so well, and really all podcasts are, is just a recorded version of radio, the, the audio ones. So uh, no radio. And, and of course, as long as you're linked to a good, strong website, and most of us are, in fact, we now have web staff who do long form stories, uh, that are much longer than you'd hear on the radio broadcasting doing okay. Yeah. So you talked a lot about politics on this show. Um, does that give you just um, a narrow slice of audience, a bigger slice of audience? We know what goes on on a lot of talk radio. It's the latest entertainment news or what the movie stars are up to or light, bright and trite. You were not that. No, we, we would do some lifestyle. We we try to filter in. We, we always wanted to be where our audience is. And yeah. uh and the audience would come to the show for politics, but they'd also come for perspective. And when you do what I do, it's about, I mean, people would be quite shocked 
that I was so opinionated. Uh, well, it's about <laughs> opinion and perspective. And uh, you don't have yeah. to agree with me, but the issue is, here's what I think today about these issues. So, you know, come and agree with me, uh, give it more, uh, more of a fleshing up. Me. Yeah. Disagree with me, exactly. Yeah. Counter. So that's really what it's about. But politics, we spend a lot of time on, but not exclusively, because I think people are that way as well. We have a lot of varied points of view and varied interests. The thing about this connection um, is that you, have, you of course, <coughs> make it seem so uh, simple as if just all of this stuff is off the top of your head and you're having a conversation about 18 different topics in any given morning. But I know, and many people know, this is a lot of homework to be able to talk as if it's coming right off uh, the top of your head or you're just thinking about it. You're a junkie. Absolutely. I, and that, that will take a while. In fact, the first thing I did is I didn't realize I had so many news notifications on my phone. So <laughs> I, I disabled most of them and just <laughs> left one or two. So, you know, if my phone bongs, it's because something fairly meaningful is happening. Uh, right. Whereas 25 years, um, even before you know, we had smartphones doing this, you know, it was every morning, 4.35 o'clock, two or three screens, news aggregators, you know, five or six newspapers. I mean, you sort of immersed yourself in that world. And uh, and that really just fulfilled what I love, which is news and, and politics. Yeah. Uh, but I've got to obviously ration that back a little. I mean, that's, you know, I've got other things to do in my life now. Yeah, well, we'll see <laughs> how this goes, <laughs> won't we? Um okay, I want to go a little bit back to how this all uh how this all started because uh, in one of your books, I think, which I don't think it's the one I wrote the cover comment for. We'll come back to that later. You talk about growing up. Um, you were not born in Canada, but you came as a young, as almost a baby, like you were two or three. Yeah. And in Saskatchewan, we don't have basements. We have rumpus rooms. <laughs> yes. And in your rumpus room, many rumpus rooms would have a couch or maybe a one of those curling games or some such thing. It was where people went when they didn't want to mess up the living room. On the walls of your rumpus room were electoral maps of the province of Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah. What are we going to say about your parents here? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my dad, in fact, this would, okay, for insiders, and I mean, uh, a lot of people are too young to remember this, one of the things that drew my dad to Saskatchewan in 1960 is he was having misgivings about the NHS in Britain, the National Health Service, which of course was, you know, government nationalized medicine. He wanted to be able to have more flexibility. So he comes to Saskatchewan, joins two other Irishmen, my dad was Irish, and they're practicing. Two years here, or a year and a bit, they bring in Medicare. So, you know, um, I always said to him, just tell me where you're betting and I'll make sure I go the opposite way. Um, but he was a he was a liberal, sort of a quintessential British Irish liberal, uh, although they all loved Churchill at various times. But he came to Saskatchewan and he really didn't like the CCF NDP. I mean, that was pretty, they were just completely inimical to his worldview. So in those days, the Liberal Party was the alternative to the NDP. Ross Thatcher then became premier in 64. So dad pretty early on just wanted to, he was a political junkie. So he had this electoral map of Saskatchewan with red and green pins or blue pins, I think it was. But, you know, the the, the liberal writings had the, the pins, the NDP had the, the red pins. So I grew up, you know, <laughs> knowing about writing names in mean, places I'd never been. I mean, when you grow up in Northwestern Saskatchewan, Yorkton or Estevan would be, you know, a day trip away, right? Yeah. So, um, but I could sure tell you that Mike Kowalchuk was one of the NDP CCF MLAs in that Yorkton area. Yeah. Um, I could tell you who the different MLAs were. So it was a, I joke in the book, other kids knew hockey players and traded hockey cards. I could tell you who MLAs were when I was six years old, which is a little peculiar. It is a little strange, although I've got to remember at the time, I mean, my dad worked in the healthcare system too. He was the... Um the x-ray technician, the only x-ray technician in the hospital. And, and this was a supper time conversation. Like, this is what you talked about. You talked about the 
whether you had to get to skating or whether you were in drama class, but you also talked about those issues at the table. I think I, I secretly believe that everybody in Saskatchewan was raised that way. I, absolutely. Saskatchewan was a place where, you know, at different times, politics ran very deep and politics sort of ran under most things. And certainly that point in the 60s, if you were a little kid in the 60s, uh, politics was never very far away. Yeah. So uh, what did your mother think about all of this? <laughs> she went along. She's an Australian. So I was a uh, I was born in Singapore of an Australian yeah. mom and an Irish dad. So it was a uh, we were uh, an odd family that way. But mom <laughs> just went along. And of course, uh, she still to this day at 93 opines on various nominations, various elections. Uh, she doesn't get out as much as she used to. But uh, my mom has knocked a lot of doors and stuffed a lot of envelopes yeah. <laughs> in a lifetime of, uh, again, reason. politics as a hobby. Did she, uh, I mean, this is, again, did she ever call into the show or does she phone you after the show and say, why did you say that, John? I raised you to be nicer than that. <laughs> That's exactly what she said a couple of times after the show. That's exactly, I mean, it's said by mothers everywhere, I think. Yeah, my mother was a teacher, so she used to phone after Canada AM or any time, even doing a news story, and correct my grammar. Um, <laughs> and now I do that the same, I do that to other people, I torture them, because I'm the daughter of a school teacher. But it is an interesting upbringing, and, and I mean, North Battleford wasn't a small town, but it wasn't a big city either. No, in Saskatoon, I mean, everywhere had, you know, you either went to the big city in Regina or the big city in Saskatoon. Yeah. Um, I remember going to you know, Regina was a real outing because we jumped yeah. like a six or Chev Impala, my dad and I, and we'd drive to rider games. And of course yeah. it was all, you know, a single lane highway. And that was a pretty good long uh, rip from Northwestern Saskatchewan. So yeah. Saskatoon was kind of the place you'd go, you know, for bigger events. Yeah. We went to Moose Jaw to see grandmother and that was like, that was, that was a big trip. Because we didn't yes. have the tires and the cars and everything that we've got now. You said to um, the premier the other day, it was on your final show. And of course, he came on, as did Brad Wall, the, the previous premier. But you said to Premier Mo, um, how have politics, how has politics changed in his time in office? So I'm just going to say it to you because in, you've got a history. You came to Ottawa. You sat as an MP, and you talk politics every day. What what stands out? You know, in, first of all, for anyone who has an interest in public service in the country, it is still, I think, the greatest opportunity to, to give. So I'll never talk young, smart, ambitious, hardworking people out of politics. Uh, even some not so young. I mean, you know, give what you can. Uh, the way politics has changed, though, uh, has been, uh, in many respects, you know, it's the, the you know the chicken and the egg. Did social media do this, or was social media the manifestation of it? But, I mean, a good example, and I and you're not the senator I'm going to refer to, but a, a good friend of mine who was a Saskatchewan senator, you know, I was telling a story about the '80s and just the last year or two in Ottawa. I chaired what was then called the Standing Committee on Communications and Culture. It's the Heritage Committee now. Um, we were doing a new broadcasting act and I would take the liberal critic out for dinner once a week. And some nights, depending on what the committee was going to do, it'd be before the committee meeting. Cause I knew, you know, I had to you know, do a little, uh, uh, and again, this was the Mulroney government. We had the largest yeah. majority in history, but it was important that I had her at least in the loop. Um, other times I'd go up for dinner with her after the committee meeting. If, you know, she wasn't happy, you know, I was there and it, it, I'm telling a, a Senator this, and the senator said, you, you had dinner with liberals? Yeah, no, no, exactly. And, and I said, well, of course I had dinner with liberals. I even had dinner with New Democrats. And this was, a, you know, a, an experienced senior Canadian public policy person. And he actually was surprised. Um, yeah. and I haven't been on the Hill in years. I mean, I go visit occasionally. But my goodness, if we've gotten to a point, you know, in the body politic that, you know, you can't, you don't have to agree with them. Sometimes you don't even have to particularly like them. But we're all there for the same reason. So, I mean, gosh, if if parliamentarians yeah. can't break bread, um, that's, I think, a sign. 
That's really broken down a lot here. I mean, this I've been in and out of this town five different times doing different jobs uh, over, you know, the course of 40 years. And it did used to be that way. Uh, everybody of all stripes uh, had their battles in question period. And everybody went out to dinner. Reporters went out. You had on the record, off the record rules that mattered. Um, but all of that kind of, you know, fed your brain. But now nobody dares do any of that. And if you're going out, you're going out only because you're like minded and uh, liberals are with liberals or conservatives are with conservatives because there's very little crossover. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, again, as combative as I could be, you know, as a radio talk show host, I mean, I'm not yeah. afraid to, you know, to have a, a good rap on politics but my goodness I, I so again that's i think a lot of canadians don't know that i certainly didn't you know yeah. i assume i mean and there was a clubbiness when i was there in fact in many ways i was in, on the hill from 84 to 88 in many respects that was a bit of a transition year and mm -hmm. uh, transition mm -hmm. cycle and i always think it sort of ended when jim fulton uh the ndp mp for skeena uh, on the prime minister's desk slapped a cold dead fish uh, mm -hmm. smuggled it into the house and slapped yeah. it on Brian's desk. I remember thinking, you know, great television, um, yeah. but I'm not sure that gets you aware. But then, of course, then as you moved into the 90s, um, you know, there were a lot of political constellations. There was the free trade debate, yeah. you know, 80s, early 90s, which really got acrimonious. So there's yeah. little benchmarks, but certainly in the 2000s, politics is really different. And, and with social media, I, I don't know how politicians do it. I have a number of younger friends who are MPs, and um, boy, they're be they're better than I am because uh, you know they live life more than a, you know, when I was there. I thought we lived in a fishbowl. It's yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah. Now you can't walk down the street because twelve people have a camera, and you don't know you know what they're yeah. capturing or or what they think they're seeing that that they may not be. But but you know, I was here when television came into the house. That changed everything radical yes. you used to have to go up to on on the hill at 10 o'clock at night and listen to a speech uh if you wanted to hear that speech it wasn't fed into your office or you know um you'd go and watch it and when the cameras came it became performance art very much and, and question period where uh, you know the old joke is it's not called answer period yeah uh, yeah but, you know, the performative question, and I remember being quite astonished in my very first couple of question periods. I'm 27 years old. You know, I'm a new, I, although I had been a media, I'd been a broadcast journalist. I'd actually yeah. done a talk show in those days. So I thought I knew my way around the media, but gosh, everything would get ready for that opening question and question period. And the place would, would silence. And it was really like being on stage. You know, the lights were brighter because of the TV cameras and, yeah. you know, bigger question you know, uh, will you admit your government is a failure? I mean, yeah. you know, which question, there's no way to answer that. So, of course, the prime minister gets up and then answers an entirely different question. And, you know, so it's deflect, attack, deflect. So that's been going on for 40 years. And I guess social media has just exacerbated that in so many ways. What do you think of social media? I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I... I, okay, I, next. I, I, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, next question. I, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I mean, I say that, but I, my wife is on Facebook, so everything I need to know, I get from her. You know, she'll the say kids, the grandkids, the uh, exactly. Yeah. Like this is going on. That's going. On. Hey, some neighbors are having you know an event. Uh, should we go over? Yeah. So I mean, but for Facebook, I wouldn't know that. But she does the the, the heavy lifting. Um, I don't know what it is. I mean, when we first started social media, it was the building of intersecting social networks, you right. know, which was quite a concept. So individually, you found like-minded people, you shared communities. Somewhere along the line, it really became a different kind of beast. I mean, it's an echo chamber, particularly yeah. on discussion and issues. You know, you yeah. gravitate only toward the people who agree with you, and you'll always find someone to do that. Um it's, you know, the whole keyboard warrior, keyboard tough guy thing. Um, I'm not going to miss that. And uh, I'm actually, I was going to, on my final day, make these big pronouncements and start canceling mm -hmm. accounts. I thought I'd, I'd let it sit a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, there might be a place for me on social media as a, you know, as a lawyer, as a public policy guy, as a as an occasional political pundit. 
Uh, I'm still weighing that, but I'm yeah. certainly in any form not going to be like the old John was because I, uh, it's just a waste of time and it's a waste of bandwidth. Yeah. But what we're seeing in the wake, and this is why the government seems so out of touch and seems to have not understood uh, life online, because all of the things that are coming up, like the line and the hub, and there's, you know, uh, lots of yep. media news, substantive um, news operations that are online. And just like the old days, they exist because people subscribe to them because they choose to pay for that. Um, and, and so it is no different than having a subscription to the Globe and Mail or the Leader Post. It's just, they deliver it to your phone, not your door. It's, it's a different, so that stuff is there and that exists, but the Twitters and the X's and the TikToks are another issue. They really are. And I, and I think my life could be completely uh, or significantly enriched if I move away from those. I mean, I, Interesting you mentioned things like, uh, or Substack, you know, there's some yeah, writers with Substack accounts. So, you know, I'm probably going to um, find a space in there. Yeah, exactly. And probably aggregate my own media consumption a little differently. You know, it won't be that headlong rush to be reading, you know, volumes of different news services. It'll be one or two that I like their perspective and their balance. And I'll, I'll go to those and I'll probably pay for them. I know it's kind of a, a silly question, and I hate it when I get it myself, but so I'll try and put it another way. Um, we all have favorite interviews or or people that we met that turned out to be a surprise. They were something that they weren't. I remember doing an interview with, um, uh, oh, now I'm going to forget his name, the Watergate boys here, the two Watergate boys. Um, oh, yeah. And, Woodward, and, and, Woodward and Bernstein. And Bernstein was a jerk. He was a complete jerk. And I had gone, I was so looking forward to this and he'd written a book. It wasn't very good, but I read it. And then he just came into the green room. He was horrible. And he was horrible. And this was an hour live show. What am I going to do? We got to, we've got to connect, right? But so uh, I'll ask you about those. And then, and then more importantly, who or, or what of your moments changed you? Gosh, you know, I've been pretty fortunate. I mean, with, um, I don't think I've had that kind of experience. I've had people who are a little bit curt. And of course, the dynamic, the beauty of the dynamic of talk radio is it's all live, and it's always moving. So I've had interviews, and I couldn't even tell you who they were now. I started the interview, and I thought, gosh, you know, speaking of fishes on desks, this is a bit of a wet fish. I mean, this is just not... Yeah. So you you wrap it up, you, 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 you five minutes when originally your plan was maybe 30, right? Yeah. So, but but I've had fun along the way. I mean, Jesse the Body Ventura, um, <laughs> the wrestler, you know, when he's the governor of Minnesota, he's in Saskatchewan at a conference, and we, we chat with him, and I get him, and I said, at the risk of putting you in deep trouble with your constituents, but remember, you're not in Minnesota now, can anyone really defend Ludafisk? <laughs> which is this Danish? I, I know what that is. I'm Swedish. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So I, I don't have to tell you. No, no, go looks, tell you. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, "Ludafisk is a wonderful dish." He's, <laughs> I said, I, I, I think you're lying. You know, and here's yes. this bruiser who still could break me in half with one hand. He said, "No, I'm not." Anyway, so it was a very funny. You know, it's moments like that where you yeah, just yeah. Ludafisk, just for those who might not know, and I think the Vikings invented this horrible stuff because it, <laughs> it's white fish in barrels filled with lye so that it would last for 400 years and you could eat it and not die. Um, but it doesn't. I, when I went to Sweden, I've got to say, John, we went, I, I arrived there, I was going to the Nobel Prize ceremonies, and I and they they had a big banquet for us, and I said, I have to get up and have the lutefisk. My father will never forgive me. And my Swedish host said, pardon the language, everybody. We don't eat that shit here. <laughs> Literally. Good. The modern modern day Scandinavia finally looked <laughs> saw, saw it for what it's terrible. And, yes, and when I was me, I would go to the sons of Denmark, who were a fraternal group, yeah. and they couldn't stay away from lutefisk, and it was awful. Yeah. So you know, so you get these you get these funny moments. I mean, yeah. we've had different. Um, I, I had Jerry Seinfeld on just a few weeks ago, and yeah. then I had Bob Bob Newhart on ten years ago. So yeah. you know, we have 
all sorts of different uh, uh, people over the years, from politics to comedy, the lifestyle, and you know, and again, invariably, and you, I mean, you're a great interviewer still. I mean, you never lose those skills. Mm-hmm. Interviews are finding that common ground, which is often our humanity. I mean, we all get up and have, you know, similar ambitions and similar life stories, although some of them might be surrounded by a phalanx of security and private jets and what have you. Their humanity isn't much different than anybody else's. So, you know, how do you tap into it with, you know, common shared interests? And I mean, you talk about ones that are moving. I've long forgotten the the woman's name. um, And I want to say Lethbridge. I think it's Lethbridge. Um, a, A woman who's a school teacher there who became very active in the organ donation community and describes her daughter's death and her daughter, 16, 17 turns in the path of a, of a semi and is killed. And the way the mom describes what a family goes through with organ donations, I couldn't keep my composure. And I just, uh, I, I don't know what it was, but it was the, just again, that shared humanity, the way this mom spoke, um, the way she talked about the importance of, you know, of doing in your worst moment in your, yeah. your imagination, doing the right thing. And uh, that turned me in ways. Um, she still to this day, I tear up even thinking about it. It's amazing. Uh, mental health. You know, we I, I used to do a lot of work on the mental health issue. Also mental health charities and fundraising. You'd hear people who went through incredible journeys. And again, it sort of reminds us sometimes. You know, if you're fortunate, uh, as I've been, you know, how incidental, you know, what I think my problems are. Um, yeah. The mental health journey for so many people and families is is absolutely, uh, Michael Landsberg, who you know from CTV, yeah. uh, you know, Landsberg has been, uh, and he's been a good friend of the show over the years. He comes in studio, we chat. I mean, that man has been an he's absolute. Powerful. He's powerful. Very, when, yeah. yeah. So there are those moments and, and. And sometimes, I don't know, I've experienced, I'm sure you have too, where your mind changes. I mean, you start out in a discussion and you have a point of view because you always have a point of view. Um, it's your job to have a point of view. Uh, but that you're, somebody may say something to you that actually changes your mind and you go, honestly and truly, I hadn't thought of it that way before. And that is because, as you say, you're live and you're there, but it's real. Yep, Absolutely. You know, and I've, uh, and, and and sometimes people ask me, what were the issues you changed your mind on? I, I can't, a lot of them don't conjure up because again, yeah. as they evolve too, because when you yeah. immerse yeah. yourself in, you know, as much news and information over time, what you thought was a really good idea isn't such a good idea. Right. Or, no, no, that's it, that is exactly right. It is more nuanced and sort of gradual. I want to come back to, um, to the province that we both love. <laughs> And call home and and if you don't live in Saskatchewan, you don't care about this, just get a cup of coffee. But but John and I are going to talk about it for a bit because we both grew up at a time, me a little before you, where um, I think Premier Mo said it the other day where, you know, you kind of you kick the ground and look down and say, I'm sorry. And we always felt in Saskatchewan that the crop was bad and the weather was bad and the next year crop was going to be bad, but we didn't deserve anything better. Where did that come from? Like a lot of alchemy, there were a lot of elements in this equation. Part of it was the single biggest defining event uh, in the, the life of Saskatchewan. And that's of course the great depression. You know, growing up as we did, everybody had parents or grandparents who'd lived through the Great Depression. It changed their view fundamentally. I mean, imagine when you've got, you know, a significant proportion of the entire province on social assistance. People can't eat. Um, You know, insurance companies, banks, trust companies simply just shutter their offices and move away and they never come back. So the Depression meant something. Um, and of course, uh, Pierre Burton referred to it as the 10 lost years because the, the market, the stock market crashes in the fall of 29, which throws the world into a depression just about the same time Saskatchewan has a roughly, you know, eight to 10 year drought. So not only is the world economy upside down, you can't grow a crop. So that begins everything. And then psychologically, it starts to extend to if it's really good now. It's not going to last. 
And now I, in my first book, left out, which was a, a, a bit of an indictment of Saskatchewan's history of the NDP. Yeah. I right. argued that socialism played into that because socialism doesn't do well with high expectations and excellence. You know, if you can revel in this idea that we're all in it together and it's not very good, and um, anything that's going on isn't going on for me, and it's somebody, you know, who's rich and better off than me exploiting me. I mean, socialism works better in that environment. So we, we in our body politic from 1944, when Tommy Douglas is elected, really until the end of the Grant Divine years, which were just a, a nine-year period in the 80s, there was always this view that Saskatchewan, you know, really wasn't ever going to rate too much. and. Even as a kid growing up, I remember thinking, I don't get this. And then, question, and you probably did the same thing, everybody over the age of 40 knows the answer to this question. What was the most common grade 12 graduation gift in Saskatchewan? Luggage. <laughs> <laughs> because you weren't going to stay, right? I mean, so the idea was, you know, and, and I got luggage for my grade 12. I stuck around. Um, but my gosh, I go back to when I graduated high school, the number of my friends, there was this brand new, excitingly weird place up in northern Alberta where they'd found a way to, you know, to extract oil from you yep. know, from this uh, Fort McMurray, right? Um, so you went to Edmonton, Calgary, or Fort McMurray, typically, you know, if you were a Saskatchewan grad. And, uh, and we went through cycles, but there was this weird psychology. And, and then even part of it was our education. I mean, I'm embarrassed to admit it was only when I was, I do a lot of convention speaking on yeah. attitude, these things. It was only as an adult in the 2000s, and this shocks even people today, 1911 until 1942, the third largest province in Canada by population was Saskatchewan. Yeah. Most people don't know that, right? You yeah. were never taught that in school because no, no, that would... It's not, yeah. You know, that would be counter to the narrative, you know, that nothing much ever happens here. So, um, and of course, what happened is we were the place that agriculture, you know, the, the homesteading, this sort of thing, uh, even BC hadn't opened ports, BC hadn't opened the lumber industry, even in the depths of the Great Depression, our population was higher than British Columbia. So everywhere else after the Second World War, just take off uh, Saskatchewan retained roughly the same population from the 30s to the 70s. Um, yeah. you know, and we would, the elusive million we used to talk about, we find a million it's people in the 80s, then we went up and down. And, you know, so it's been an interesting story. I had a friend come up and visit from New York and my sister and I went and picked him up uh, in Regina and, and we went up Highway 6 to get, and like, he was stunned. He looked around and he said, where are all the people? <laughs> I said, Alberta. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> but then it's it did start to change. I mean, I remember when I moved east to to work in the media business and, and my parents were mortified. You know, I was going almost into enemy territory because when you grow up, I mean, the railways are bad. We ship our wheat and then we pay way too much for the bread when it comes back. And, you know, the crow rate and all like and then you come into these circumstances. It's like you're talking another language. People still to this day on Parliament Hill don't understand why not everybody has an electric vehicle, because I don't think they really experienced minus 50. <laughs> Well, you know, and exactly. And even, you know, you, you look in, of course, we've always had a vast you know, land mass and now yeah. we're at one, two million and counting, but still yeah. that's a small population. But now there's this interesting view that, you know, in the whether you're in the tech sector, whether you're in uh, anything to do with resources, uh, you know, why wouldn't you be in Saskatchewan? And of course, we're fortunate, uh, you know, when a house in Toronto and a house in Vancouver, you yeah. know, yeah own freestanding house is north of a million, uh, you can still get one, a very nice one here for 400 and some thousand. So, you know, it's, it makes a good case for, for families and for young people. We're going through this debate now in the House of Commons and in the Senate about uh, the bill, a, a tax break for um, farmers who need to dry grain or, or keep their chickens warm, whatever it may be. And, and, it, and, as you know, the government is, wants to kill this bill, and Stephen Gilbo is is um, 
very uh, direct about this issue, having just said to Atlantic Canada, you know, we're going to give you a break on home heating oil. So my view, and I know the view of other people, is you can't do this in a country if you want to try and keep it together. You can't play one part off against another. Another. What? What's your gut on this? Exactly yours. But I, I think what's happening, um, and I was talking with a friend the other day who's a public policy thinker, and uh, he made an interesting point. He said, most of us who opposed the carbon tax did so from day one. Yeah. You know, and this, and this fallacy that comes from the left, well, carbon taxes are a conservative concept. Well, they were a conservative concept if you paid no other taxes. You know, they were a conservative concept right. when Ronald Reagan said, if you want to pump you know, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide out your smokestacks, um, and, you know, and cause acid rain, you can do that, but we're going to charge you more than it costs you to have scrubbers, right? right? So yep. there was an incentive. The idea that a carbon tax can incent anything when you produce 1.6% of all the world's carbon dioxide, you know, Canada could be, you know, net zero carbon free tomorrow. Uh, it would take China several afternoons. To, to, to compensate us. But so even that, the carbon tax was never an efficient, appropriate way of doing things because at the end of it all, and I ask Canadians to get their head around this, you have to feel pain because you have to say to yourself one day, I can't drive my car anymore. Uh, yeah. I can't afford to heat my home in minus 40. Um, oh, and by the way, they have a name for you if you want to do those things. You are a polluter. Yeah. So, so the concept, you know, I can argue you know, for hours, if you'd like, on, on the folly of this, stru this structure carbon tax. But my friend, the public policy thinker, said, isn't it interesting, those of us who have always had problems on the policy side, we're going to be saved by Canadians who simply say, I can't afford it anymore. It's a yeah. tax that makes everything more expensive. Axe the tax, again, which is a pretty, uh, the only problem is axe the tax is what Jean Chrétien said about the GST. So, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm taking Pierre Polyev at his word, you don't yeah. need a form of carbon tax. So all of a sudden, the, the, the policy flaws of this crazy system, I think are going to be undone by average Canadians who say, I, I can't keep doing this. Because this is the thing. I mean, the, those that support a, a carbon tax concept, as you say, to the, the Reagan example, this was on big corporate polluters. It, it wasn't yeah. ever designed to be on, you know, me driving back and forth to Saskatoon to get on a plane or me drying my grain. Uh, you know, this bill, these bills are tens of thousands of dollars to do what they have to do because it rained in August. Um, you yeah. know, it, it just seems so um, bizarre. Well, and I think in some parts, Pam, there was this, you remember Mr. Trudeau hired this deliverology expert? Yes, yes. Man, and we, we always joke. I mean, you know, the Trudeau government has not had a really good record at delivering much. But yeah. in many ways, there was some, I think the hand of this deliver, deliverology thing might have been more present than we know. We were sucked in on the carbon tax originally because we kept thinking of what's the cost of a price of liter of gas. Yeah. And right, right now it's 14 cents more. Well, 14 cents is painful, but that's not, you know, I'm not going to change my life over 14 cents a liter. I'm just going to gripe a bit. Yeah. Look at how we heat our homes. The price for natural gas, and I know that better than home heating oil, the, the carbon tax on one cubic meter of natural gas is exactly the same price as the actual price of it. So, you know, a gigajoule, for example, which is another measurement, you know, that for the a gigajoule of natural gas is being taxed, I think, 250, 265, something like that, a, a gigajoule. That's the price of it. So yeah. when you get your home heating bill, you're actually paying nearly double. So that can and that's at 65 bucks a ton. Imagine yeah. the folly of going to 170. I mean, none of us will be able to heat our homes. Because this is the kind of issue, and, and again, people sort of dismiss it, um, that that really undermines the, the already pretty frayed fabric of this country. 
Uh, I mean, we've been through a lot with, you know, Quebec separation, and we've been through a lot with economic crisis and, and lockdowns and the whole nine yards. And this just feels like something that is bigger than it is. Absolutely. Is bigger, yeah. No, and I, and I you know, I, I, I'm, again, I'm old enough to remember the National Energy Program and what that did <laughs> to Alberta and, you know, Saskatchewan yeah. to a large extent. I haven't, and I was young enough. I mean, of course, when you're young, you're very much more hopeful. Uh, so this second or Trudeau redux approach, which is arguably even more divisive. I mean, the NEP was on, you know, the way you priced you know, oil produced in Alberta. Now from Bill C-69, which has been struck down to, you know, the, the cancellation of pipelines, to anything to do with fossil fuels, now the carbon tax on farmers. I mean, every time you turn around as a Westerner, it's as if somebody said, this is for you. Um, yeah. And I, I muse aloud like I never did before. I mean, you know, Wilfrid Laurier in 1905, uh, Frederick Haltain, who had been the last premier of the Northwest Territories, Haltain wanted this new territory to start at the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border and go to the Alberta-BC border. So it would be the combined province landmass today of Alberta and Saskatchewan. It would be called Buffalo. Yeah. And as Wilfrid Laurier said, no, in part, that big a landmass would really compete with Quebec and Ontario. Um, and plus, he wanted you know two premiers who were both sitting Liberal MPs, two lieutenants governor, two provinces. But I muse aloud some days, could you imagine if Saskatchewan and Alberta yeah. became one territorial district? That I mean, let's be all part of proud Canadians, but I would really muse sometimes about the idea of what our impact would be on GDP, what our impact would be on Canada if we had these two land masses together. Yeah, and and the the politics of it because that's that's the other issue, right? I mean, we always, you know, the well, uh, the prime one of the prime minister's ministers said it. You know, we're we're doing this this carbon tax issue, and maybe you want to vote liberal, and maybe we'll be nicer to you. Like usually, <laughs> that's the stuff that is the inside voice, not the outside voice. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah, if you just elected more liberal MPs, imagine yeah. what you. Could I, I, and I want to do, because the, the province did change, and, and we all kind of felt it instinctively. Um, you were writing this book uh, called Left Out, which with its double entendre there, which is um, when the SAS party, and it, it had a few leaders, but it was really Brad Wall that, that changed this, that we became a place where hope did beat fear and and he used those remarks he was on your last program the other day he was a very um charismatic leader but one guy doesn't come into politics and change the province uh overnight although some days it feels like it needed him yeah you know it, it's interesting and, and brad wall will be the first person to say this um you know, he that message of hope beats fear was at exactly the right time. And really what he did was he provided the environment for a lot of people to coalesce around the notion, you know, that those days are gone now. Those days of negative, those days yeah. of Saskatchewan will never amount to anything. Um, that's behind us. We have incredible opportunity. We can seize this and we can think differently. And Brad uh, was so much a catalyst for that. But um, I, I think, as you say, one person in our system doesn't usually make a difference, but one person, I think, as a symbol, one person sort of holding that beacon uh, can really have people rally. And, and Bradwell did that very effectively to a province that was ready. Did you feel it? Like, when did you, you know, doing the show, you're constantly taking the pulse of people and you know when they phone you and when they're down and out and when they're frustrated with city hall or you know the provincial ledge or whatever it is did w was that growing was there how how did you experience that absolutely and i felt it i, I used to write a newspaper column in the star phoenix so yeah. weekly years nearly 20 years and i remember remarking on i would want to say it was in 2005 which as you remember was our centennial yeah. and it was a wonderful year and we used to joke you know, everything, there were all these events. There was that great big uh, uh, event in Saskatoon where the queen, you know, was in a private yeah. bar 
there were entertainers. Um, it was fabulous, except nobody was here for it. You know, our population was just heading down precipitously. Yeah. Um, and actually, the interesting part is, and, and Brad Wall will be the first person to say this, Saskatchewan had been in continuous freefall on population, and it was July of 06, the freefall stopped, and then every single quarter from July of 06, Saskatchewan had more people than the quarter before. That has sustained itself except for two quarters in the middle of the pandemic, you know, where mm -hmm. our population flattened and I think at one point lost 100 people. But, you know, so this has been the longest run of, of population, so much so in the last year or two, that you had to go back to those days of 1911, 1912 to find bigger numbers. So it's, it's, so you could feel, and I remember in this newspaper column, you know, I talked about just this vibe that was present. You know, you were getting the sense, uh, yeah. you, you know, anecdotally, you were meeting people coming in from other provinces saying, you know, this is a, you know, this is a, a hidden secret. You know, why don't more people do this? And I, I remember, you know, meeting some people who'd moved here from Ontario in 05, 06. Uh, and in those days, the average house price and this was a beautiful big house out in the new suburbs. It was one hundred and seventy thousand bucks. <laughs> you know, and these people had left Toronto, where in those yeah. days the house prices would have been, you know, four, five, six hundred thousand. You know, they could have bought you know three houses here, and right. um, so you could feel it happening. And so often, as you know, in your your media background, trend spotting happens several quarters before everybody's talking about it. Right. So you could sense here something was happening. And then, um, you know, the politically Brad Wall is elected in late 07. And then he really becomes, again, the figurehead and the symbol. But people were ready here back in 05, 06. Just we were tired of that old way of thinking, that old way of accepting Saskatchewan had to be a certain way. And kids came home, not necessarily to the farm, because farms are getting bigger. So there's fewer people, but there was mining activity and there was all sorts of potash, of course, is huge, um, provided we're allowed to build new mines ever. I don't know. But, um, you know, there, there was a reason then to come back or to come for the first time, as you say, and kind of discover this beautiful spot it's not just all driving down the number one highway right it's we have more yeah. lakes in ontario <laughs> yeah absolutely you know and, and it's one of the big tells i mean you've been you know in ontario enough of your life i mean if somebody's been on number one um and even i get you know discombobulated driving on the number one because i'm a yeah. you know i'm a parkland guy you know up in the battle fords up in the northwest i i've never seen that much flat i mean saskatchewan is yeah. like a pool table um yeah goes for miles and miles, and even at the sight of a tree is quite rare. Whereas <laughs> head up Highway 16 is what I always recommend people do through your stomping grounds and mine, you know, which is kind of the diagonal Trans-Canada. Uh, then you get up into the parkland, you get up into the mixed, yeah. you know, the boreal forest. Um, and of course, with 100,000 surveyed bodies of water, uh, this is a province that is astonishingly beautiful as you start to move up into the, the, the forest yeah. country. But of course, for a lot of Ontario and Quebec people who never got off number one, they don't have a frame of reference. They, they just don't know. Okay, um, the, our time has gone so fast here. I want to play a little game, Mr. Gormley. So I'm, I'm going to say a name and then you're going to say what pops into your head. Okay, because you pay attention to the politics writ large. So let me say, let me, I'll start with Joe Biden. <sighs> Sorry, I sighed. Um, <laughs> I I don't think he's capturing America's uh, incredible opportunity and potential, and he's not helping a deeply divided America. Donald Trump. Part of the problem. Um, early on, economic policy sensible, I thought. Um, the most unpresidential, disrespectful of the office person who's ever lived, and I just wish Donald Trump would go away. So let's come home. Uh, Justin Trudeau. Much the same if I could combine Donald Trump and Joe Biden. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, again, not, not quite the, uh, you know, the, the temperament of Trump, but uh, this prime minister, uh, if ever he had it, uh, really, uh, it's performative. 
It's uh, a gross miscalculation of the nature of, of the Canadian character. Uh, you can't be a social justice activist and an identity politics person as he is and be taken seriously. I've, I'm going to diverge for just a moment because I thought one of the funniest things I've seen was when when uh, the prime minister was at the APEC meeting and he met with Gavin Newsom, who might well be the president one day. And and the prime minister was wearing the socks that Gavin New, Newsom had given him eight years ago. And Newsom looked at him and said, are you still doing that sock thing? <laughs> yeah. of, it was it was an astounding moment in my, in oh. my mind anyway. <laughs> I, I, would do. I mean, you know, I, I must admit, I have a drawer full of wild and crazy socks and I'm not a big fashionista, but I catch GQ enough to know, you know, men's socks have really scaled down. I mean, yeah. the idea of bright logoed socks, you look like a clown. Yeah, um, we're back. We're back to black. Guys, yeah. Guys don't wear those blue and black and brown have made a comeback. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Pierre Polyam. Uh I'm encouraged by Polyev. Um, my only misgiving is he's been you know, a full-time career politician his entire life. Uh, I've met him many times socially. Um, he's a man of, of remarkable substance. And I think as an antidote to Trudeau, he's what the country needs. He needs to be as edgy as he's been to exorcise the demon of the Trudeau years. How about truckers? Truckers, when you do a radio talk show, are some of the the most long term listeners because they'll dial in for four hours a day. Um, I think truckers, uh, whether it was the the convoy, yep. whether it was earlier carbon tax ones, truckers feel really disempowered because they work hours most of us couldn't, in circumstances most of us won't, and uh, thankless work. And they're also, interestingly enough, when you're by yourself in a cab for 8 and 10 and 12 hours a day, you think a lot. And yeah. some of the most thoughtful people I have ever met have been truckers. So I'm a big fan of them. And I think, again, it is a disgraceful legacy, uh, the invoking of the Emergencies Act. Uh, again, the truckers weren't all in the right on some of the, you know, the, the seizing of Wellington and the, the, the gridlock. But that didn't constitute a national emergency, and I'll never be convinced it was. So I'm not sure how to phrase the next one, but I'm just going to say what we're seeing on our university campuses and streets today with pro-Hamas rallies, um, you know, some counter with the, with the rallies in supporting the Jewish population. But, boy, it's ugly. It's terrible. But this is what happens. I mean, again, Decisions always have consequences. When you turn to identity politics, social justice, critical race theory, you need oppressors and oppressed. You need white skin and some other color skin. Add up that alchemy of insanity, and all of a sudden anti-Semitism uh, is understandable. It's odious, and the fact that some of the most young, privileged, bright Canadians have you know, have been lulled into this, but again, they've been taught critical race theory, social justice, and identity politics since they were in kindergarten. I mean, this is a this is a failure of Canada's education system. So what do you make now of the supply and confidence agreement? We've just seen that, you know, they've all agreed kind of quietly that PharmaCare will go away. The NDP didn't want to take the heat for the cost. The Liberals don't want to spend the money. So what happens? I, I understand what was in it, obviously, for both the Liberals and the New Democrats when they entered that agreement. I don't, for the life of me, understand how that agreement sustains itself, except politicians are politicians are pretty understandable when they're about to lose their jobs. And the NDP is polling still well enough, I think, you know, what, depending on the poll, yeah. they're still up around 20%. So a lot of today's caucus may well be returned. If the NDP start to, in the court of public opinion, be punished like the Liberals are, you know, yep. once the NDP start to slip down to 12 and 13 percent, they all lose their jobs. But right now, there's no sign they will. So this is a little bit like being in a lifeboat together. So the rants, are you going to miss the rants? Those were very, very contained, very, <laughs> I don't know, very un-John Gormley-like, really. 
I listen to you a lot on the radio because I listened at night to the replay. And sometimes you get quite exercised. So are you calming down or are we going to see these rants emerge every once in a while? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I mean, the rants took on their own life. You know, I was sometimes just a vessel. You know, I would I would wake up, I'd be doing some show prep, I'd be reading. And of course, as you you know, I mean, you know, when you when you do a show like that, you're prepping every single moment you're awake. Yeah. And then a rant would emerge. So there's probably it's considerate opportunity and location. You know, I'm not sure it would be appreciated, certainly by my wife and my friends. If every so often I launched into a seven minute and 30 second rant, which was the time, <laughs> um, that would really mess up, uh, you know, a dinner or cocktail party. So the rants will likely just, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll still emerge occasionally, but I think uh, over time they'll just fade away. Uh, the, the, the folks in my office put up with them um, because I have them in here and I sometimes have them in my hotel room in front of the television screen. Uh, I will rant at um, what I'm hearing and what I'm looking at. Not so much the story as how they're presenting the story. <laughs> yes. Well, and you and you are one of the people, again, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but you are a media critic because you've lived your life at a very high yeah. level in media. Yeah. And if any industry today that could use some critiques in the yeah. hope of trying to save it, it's yeah. the media. At this rate, uh, they're all going to disappear, and that's uh, that's not good. Okay, that should part be part of your new job as well, as long with being a lawyer and, you know, having a life, having a family life. Well, actually, yeah, and, and I still will, con I, I'm amazed at the, the number of conventions I'm still speaking at, and I'm actually yeah. going to work on a speech, because I have four or five speeches that I, you know, I do, right, right. Uh, really an hour-long rant, um, but I, I'm actually going to do one on the future of the Canadian media, because I right. think earning point that most consumers of the media don't appreciate. And again, in, in rants earlier, I said that many in the media are like the walking dead, you know, the zombies. They're dead. They just don't know it yet. Don't and know it. That's not good. And, and no, no number of bailouts is really going to change that calculation. Not a dollar. I look forward to it, John. Just great talking with you and I wish you all the very best. Uh, I think this was a a brave but smart decision uh, to go at the top and uh, have a little bit more time for that second, third, fourth act. It's great. You know, lots of projects, Senator, and it's, yeah. again, great delights of the show, and I hope after uh, is bumping into you. And thanks so much for what you do. We'll keep in touch. That's great. John Gormley, the host for 25 years. Did media before that, but 25 years, five days a week, the Gormley Show, it it was the place, and this was their slogan, where Saskatchewan came to talk, but lots of people from other places as well. Um, so you did, a, you did a great service, and thank you for that. All the best. Have a great Christmas. Thanks. All the best to you and yours. Bye-bye. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Mullen.